First of all, um, I, I want to just sort of echo everything Michael said. I think he said it very well. I do have one recommendation, though. If you want to come to the United States and talk about curing aging, that's fine. But don't talk about climate change. It's a bad idea. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, Mike asked me to talk about funding aging research and how we're doing it at the Buck and some of the challenges we have. And, you know, all of you are on different, different sort of levels of this, and some of you are already in the choir, and so this might be boring for you, but I'm going to go very quickly. And I want to uh, take, take it from a slightly different angle and talk about what I think is an absolute mandate that we fund aging research and do something about aging, because I don't think our society is going to economically survive if we don't think seriously about how we're doing health care. And there's several reasons for this, and you've seen these slides, probably some of you. Uh, life expectancy is going up dramatically. Uh, it's gone up about, in the U.S., about four years for, out of every, in the last 20 years. Uh, it's going up in every country. Um, interestingly, um, Japan was the same as the United States in 1970 and has dr diverged dramatically in the last 40 years. So some countries are doing a better job of dealing with health care uh, and other uh, lifestyle issues than others. And I think you can ask why the United States is not going up as fast. But what this is doing is it's creating a lot of older people in the world. And so this is 2050, looking at the percentage of the population over the age of 65 40% um, in Japan, 30% in Germany. Uh, the United States is 21%. It's a little bit lower for various reasons that I won't go into in too much detail. But you can say this is a global phenomenon. And if you add into that the fact that people over 65 have much higher health care costs, they're typically not working, uh, and they're, they're not uh, able to contribute to society in, in other ways as well as people that are younger, you've got an economic crisis on your hands. And what frustrates me is when governments recognize this, they get together, they talk about it, they come up with plans. Uh, this is a recent plan from one of these big meetings about what each country has to do about the, the crisis of the aging population. And they, they talk about things like public pensions and retirement age and poverty floors and the increasing fertility rates and immigration and all those things are fine. Some of them, many of them I'm not an expert on and can't really comment. But what never gets brought up in the conversation is what about keeping people healthy longer? It seems like the simplest solution, right? If we can find ways to slow aging and extend human health span, then people can keep working, they can keep contributing, they can raise their grandkids, they can, as you said, Michael, they can uh, do a lot of things that bring younger generations along, add their wisdom to our decision making. There's so many great reasons to do this, and yet it's not in the conversation. And this is on top of a healthcare industry that's, that's just not working. You know, here's, uh, life expectancy versus total health expenditure per capita. Um, it's pretty much linear. And then here's the United States. We're spending two and a half times per capita on health care of any other country in the world. And if you look at life expectancy, which is one good measure of health care, we rank 50th in the world. What are we not doing in this country? Well, we're not keeping people healthy. We're doing sick care. We're not doing health care. Here's another way to look at it. Here's life expectancy, and here's healthy life expectancy in the last 20 years. As I said, if you're a man, life expectancy has gone up four years. You're getting a 20% return on investment. Female life expectancy has gone up two years. But healthy life expectancy is not going up at the same rate. We're doing sick care. We're keeping you alive, but we're keeping you sick. We wait till you get serious chronic diseases, and then we spend a fortune trying to treat those diseases. Rarely do we cure them. Often we just uh, help you manage them a little bit better, keep you alive a little bit longer. And is that really what we want to be spending the millions and billions of dollars on health care for when we have another opportunity, which is this, is to recognize that there's something that's driving all of these processes. And right now, we treat them individually. We wait till you get Alzheimer's, we wait till you have a stroke. But we know that aging is the biggest risk factor for all these diseases. And we know in animal models that if you target aging, you can delay many or all of these diseases simultaneously. And yet, we're not spending any money here. So this is what I think is the problem. We're not thinking progressively about healthcare. We're not taking all this information we've generated over the years and reimagining how we're going to invest money to do something good for people. We're just continuing along the same siloed approaches of targeting one disease at a time. 
I think this is totally achievable, you know, this extending health span. And let me just go through this slide in case you haven't seen it. You know, this is your life. You're born, you don't do a whole lot, mostly in terms of staying healthy. You start getting sick, you get worse, you die. <laughs> All right, it's a little simple. Uh, <laughs> And it's funny because you ask people, they don't live longer, a lot of them say no, and you ask why, and they say, they're imagining what we're trying to do is this. You're born, you get sick at the same time, but we then have better ways of keeping you alive, and so we drag out this period. Well, that's not what we're trying to do, that's what's happening right now. That's what's happening in healthcare. We're not focusing on this, we're focusing on this. And I think it's entirely possible based on data already and at least in animal models to achieve this, to extend lifespan, but also to extend health span at the same time. And I also think it's gonna be possible to get this compressed morbidity where you're healthy for a very long time and then there's a rapid period of decline, although that may a little, be a little bit further in the future. This is the economic victory. This is the quality of life victory. This is what we should be spending money on. And we already have strategies that slow aging. Um, in, at least in animal models, and in some cases we have evidence in humans. Uh, calorie restriction, you probably heard about that. I'm, I'm gonna show like two data slides here, and that's it. Uh, there's great data on exercise. Uh, intermittent fasting is quite interesting. Even alcohol, there's data on extending lifespan. I'm not recommending heavy alcohol use, don't, don't quote me. Uh, and then there are a number of drugs that are being developed in animal models that slow aging. Rapamycin is my favorite. 30% lifespan extension in female mice, 23% extension in male mice. It prevents a whole range of diseases associated with aging. Looks like it extends health span. So here's where we are. Um, we have candidate interventions. We don't know if they work in humans yet, but we have a number of candidates. We're developing biomarkers of aging. There are a lot of good candidate biomarkers emerging. I don't think any of the newer ones like methylation are completely validated yet, but they have, they're strong candidates. We may have a number of these in the near future. We're starting to get the regulatory agencies to think about this. So there's a, the efforts to have a trial on human health span now that the FDA is starting to pay attention to. These things are starting to come together, and if they do, I think we'll achieve longer, healthier lives. Well, we don't have us this up here. We're still not feeding this pipeline in any kind of way that's gonna accelerate discovery. We're all struggling uh, for stability uh, as institutes rather than looking to grow. And that's really uh, frustrating to me uh, as a director of an aging institute because as this National Geographic episode said, this is the age of aging. Aging is gonna be the biggest medical problem of the first half of the 21st century. Why don't we think now about how to do something about it? And if you look at the funding, you know, in nonprofit institutions, our biggest funder is still the NIH, um, other foundations. We've been much more active in the last few years in trying to do starting our own companies and doing corp corporate partnership. We've spun off seven for-profit companies that are in the, either targeting aging or diseases of aging. And then, of course, we're very active in trying to find philanthropy. Uh, but, you know, it... it the NIH thing is a little bit frustrating. Here's funding by institute in the NIH. Okay, here's your biggest risk factor for every disease, National Institute of Aging. It's one, about one-fourth the budget of the National Cancer Institute. And, but that's misleading because only about 20% of this money actually goes to the biology of aging. That includes Alzheimer's and other things that are interesting and important. But aging is only about here in this, it's about 1% of the total budget. And if you're an investigator asking for grants in aging, this is the pay line for the National Institute of Aging at the beginning of the fiscal year 2016. Now actually it's gone up by 2% since then, so we're, it's up to 9%, I think. But if you're writing a grant, this is the number that matters, you have about a 9% chance of getting that grant. All these good ideas out there for research uh, are not getting funded. Nine out of 10 of them are not getting funded. And so the federal government's not coming through to solve this problem. And then pharmaceutical companies are still struggling with this approach, which is that they like to develop disease treatments because there's a clear path to get these drugs approved, and there's a clear way to make money. 
they put less emphasis on prevention and very little on doing things to healthy people to keep them healthy longer. And yet the promise of aging research is around this, I think, as much as anything else, and, and certainly disease prevention. So how do we cross these barriers? We've made some progress, but pharmaceutical companies are generally still not pouring large amounts of money into aging. So, you know, we're sitting here struggling with these different uh, opportunities and how we uh, grow an institute focused on the biggest problem of this century. And uh, it's frustrating, it really is, to figure out solutions. And, and we have a lot of ideas, some of which have been successful. Uh, but I, I think that we're still trying to find the answers, and maybe that's what we can talk about. I just want to put this up because you know, we're still arguing about whether lifespans are long enough or not. You know, when the, uh, this debate uh, group in New York asked uh, Aubrey and I to participate in an Oxford-style debate, we had to argue that lifespans were not long enough. Uh, and so I think that it's a matter of changing public perception. My point was that it depends whether lifespan's long enough or not. You know, it depends on whether you're healthy. The real question should be, should our health spans long enough? And I think the obvious answer to that is no. So, uh, but it's still a big, it's a big public challenge to convince people what we're trying to do makes a lot of sense. And I, I'm all ears on, on your ideas as well because we're, we're trying to find the answers. Thank you.